Good morning. How is everyone doing? How was the exam? What did y'all think? Not too bad? That's good. Probably better after I actually uh, uh, imported the files you actually need to do the exam. <laughs> Sorry for the, the probably the brief moment of heart attack uh, some of you experienced <laughs> when you could not find the, uh, the files. <clears throat> Expecting more from chapter 13? Yeah, I guess there wasn't too, too much from there. Yeah, true. Yeah, buddy. All righty. So, moving right along. So today, uh, we're going to start talking about functions of several variables. Uh, what was the file? Oh, it was the it was the file for um that had the uh, the the graphs that you needed to answer the one question. Um, I hadn't, I didn't import it um, until after some people had started taking the first exam, but I think everyone, I imported it in time for everyone to, to finish. <laughs> I, I realized that went a bit late. So I will, I will be more on the ball next time. took the exam without the file. Have, did you send me an email about this? Hmm. Well, if you had if you had an issue, please please shoot me a canvas mail about this. <laughs> and we can discuss this. Okay, uh, is the final cumulative? Yes, the final will be cumulative. Um, but it's uh, more heavily weighted towards the stuff after the third midterm, but it will be cumulative, yes. Okay. So functions of several variables. And these are the uh, these are the functions that we will be focusing on for most of the rest of the uh, the course. <clears throat> okay. So uh, 140 and 141, we studied basically entirely uh, functions of one variable. And really, when we say function of one variable, we mean real valued. So we looked at vector valued functions. And those are functions where we input a real number and it spits out a vector. A real valued function is a function of one variable, is a function where you input a real number So the domain is the reals, right? You input a real number and it outputs a real number also. So the value of the function is a real number. So for example, 
If you look at the area of a circle of radius r, we can write that as a function of the radius r. And that is just pi r squared. Right, you input a real number, the radius r. The domain is going to be r greater than or equal to 0. And it outputs a real number, um, the area, which is pi r squared. So you say radius is a function, or sorry, uh, area of a circle is a function of the radius. And the radius is a single real number, one variable r in this case. <clears throat> so those are the types of functions we looked at in uh, 140 and 141. So a function of two variables is something where we're going to, instead of just inputting a real number into the function, we're going to input an ordered pair. Or you could think of it as we're inputting a point in the plane. Usually we do x, y plane, but it's we can call the variables whatever we like. So now we have two variables, x and y, or whatever we choose to call them. And like a real valued function of one variable, it's a real valued function of two variables, it's going to output a real number or just a scalar. So for instance, we could look at the area of a rectangle with dimensions x and y. Or you could think length x, height y. So that is now a function of length and height. We're inputting in ordered pair x, y, length, height. And of course, that is just x times y, a real number. That would be an example of a function of two variables. But we're inputting a point in the plane, an ordered pair, and it's outputting a real number. <clears throat> and of course, we can use however many variables we like. So we could do a function of invariables. And that's just a function where let me write it like this. Whoops, hang on. So let's say a function f. of n variables assigns a real number. So it spits out f of x1 
up to x n. So this is an ordered n tuple. So f of that n tuple is a real number. And it signs that to each n tuple x1, x2, up to xn. In the domain, we'll say d, and d is going to lie in rn. So R2 is the plane, R3 is space, et cetera, et cetera. Rn is a set of all n tuples. <clears throat> but all these guys, you're, you're inputting points in. So for two variables, points in the plane, three variables, points in space, n variables, points in you know, in dimensional space, and they're all outputting a real number. <clears throat> so we don't usually talk too much about the domain and range, but let's make sure we know how to deal with those. So let's sketch the domain of the following function. So f of x, y is square root 9 minus x squared minus y squared. So the domain, don't get this, we're sketching the domain here. Don't get this mixed up with the graph of the function. But the domain of a function, remember, is just a set of all um, points you can plug into your function where it's defined. So set of all points x, y, so since it's a function of two variables, for which f of x, y is defined. So there might be some points we can plug in there where we get nonsense, right? It doesn't make sense. But we're going to sketch all the points that we can plug into this that make sense. OK, so square root 9 minus x squared minus y squared. So let's look at sort of the overall, sort of the outer guy here, the square root of stuff inside. So if we're going to take the square root of the number, what needs to be true of that number? So positive and um, so not just positive, not strictly greater than zero, but zero is fine too. So we need what's inside the square root to be non-negative, right? Greater than or equal to zero. So what is inside the square root must be greater than or equal to 0, right? In other classes, you can take the square root of negative stuff. In this one, we only deal with real values. So what's inside has to be positive. So we need to look at the set of points x, y, for which 9 minus x squared minus y squared is greater than or equal to 0. Well, we can rearrange this in a way um, that makes it more obvious what this is. We can just bring the x squared and y squared over. So when we add x squared and y squared to both sides, we get x squared plus y squared less than or equal to 9. <clears throat> 
Okay, so if I said x squared plus y squared, so here's here's the way I like to do inequalities, right? So for for graphing inequalities, um, what's usually going to happen is you're going to do um, instead of less than or equal to, or less than or whatever, right? Equals. What do you get if we have x squared plus y squared equals 9? What does that represent in the plane? Right, it's a circle centered at the origin of radius. Sorry, this is supposed to mean equals of radius 3. Okay, so that's sort of the dividing curve here. And then we want to see if we want everything inside of that or everything outside of that. So what I like to do is just pick a point um, on one side or the other and see whether it satisfies the inequality. So let's pick 0, 0, right? x is 0, y is 0. Is 0 squared plus 0 squared less than or equal to 9? Yes. It is, right? So we plug it into the inequality. It satisfies the inequality. So we shade the inside of the circle. Right, so now we're including everything inside the circle. And since it's less than or equal to, it also includes the circle x squared plus y squared equals 9. So you draw your curve. You, you change the inequality to an equal sign, draw your curve, and then it's going to divide your space into two pieces. You pick a point in either inside or outside. And if it satisfies the inequality, uh, so you pick a point inside. If it satisfies the inequality, everything inside is included. If it doesn't, then everything outside is included. Does that make sense? OK. And just so we can cover it, what's the range? So the range, remember, of a function is a set of all numbers the function takes on. So I'll say the set of all real numbers, C, such that our function is equal to C. So a number's in the range. If there's some point you can plug into your function where it equals that. So remember, our function is square root 9 minus x squared minus y squared. OK, so we said our domain was everything inside the circle of radius 3. So <clears throat> OK, well, the biggest this guy is going to get, so x squared, we can think of it as 9 minus x squared plus y squared, right? x squared plus y squared is always positive. And so it's 9 minus something greater than or equal to 0. The biggest that's going to be is when you're subtracting 0 from that, right? 
at zero, zero. So at the point zero, zero, nine minus x squared minus y squared is equal to square root, sorry, square root of nine minus zero is three. That's the biggest we can get. <clears throat> right, because you're always subtracting something greater than or equal to zero. The smallest we get, of course, is zero, right? When you're subtracting something on the circle, where x squared plus y squared equals nine, then you're getting square root of nine minus nine, which is zero. So the range is just gonna be from zero to three. Okay, uh, any questions about? That example. So in the graph, it was like three to negative three. Why is the range zero to three? Sorry, what? what was that? In the graph, it was three to negative three. But why is the range zero to three? So the, the domain. So this is the, the, the sketch of the domain, right? The domain is a set of points we can put in. So we're inputting a point x, y in the plane. The domain is just a set of all points you can plug into your function where your function is defined, right? So our function square root nine minus x squared minus y squared. So it's square root of something, the thing inside the square root has to be greater than or equal to zero. So we get this. And from that, we get x squared plus y squared has to be less than or equal to nine. And that set of points is given by this graph here. So the domain um, of a function of two variables is going to be a point in the plane. The range is um, the set of all real values your function will output, right? So the range is going to be a, a real number. And so we're looking <clears throat> at all the points we can input to our function. And then we're seeing what numbers does it spit out? Well, it doesn't, it's never going to spit out a negative number, right? Because the square root of something is always greater than or equal to zero. <clears throat> so when we, when we check our stuff, uh, the smallest our function can be is zero, right? When we lie on the circle, x squared plus y squared equals nine. For instance, if you input the point three zero, right? You get square root of nine minus three squared minus zero squared, which is zero. The biggest we can get is um, at the point zero, zero, right? Square root nine minus zero squared minus zero squared is gonna be square root nine, which is three. Does that? Yeah, that makes sense. So you can't, you can't tell the range of a function by looking at the graph of the domain. There are two completely separate things. So why why can be why can be negative three, right? But what happens if you plug in y equals negative, say uh, zero, the point zero negative three into your function, right? You get square root nine minus zero squared minus negative three squared, which is still zero. Okay, so that was um, sketching the domain. Um, we're not gonna do that too much, but don't get that mixed up with actually graphing. A function of two variables or several variables. So recall, if we have a function of one variable, uh, 
f of x. The graph of f of x is going to be the curve y equals f of x. In other words, it's going to be the set of points in the xy plane x f of x. So the graph of a function of one variable is a curve. And you can think of the curve, you plug in a value of x, and the height of the curve at that point is given by the function f of x. So if this is our x. Now right here, our height is f of x. And so we have a point on the curve x, f of x. So the graph of a function of one variable is the curve y equals f of x. And we think of f of x. So you pin, input a value of x. The height of the curve there is going to be the value of the function. So a similar thing works uh, for functions of two variables. So the graph of f of x, y is, so now the graph of a function of two variables is going to be a surface. So it's going to be the surface. z equals f of x, y. In other words, it's a set of points x, y, f of x, y. All right, z is equal to f of x, y. So the height of your surface above the point x, y in the plane, in the x, y plane, is given by the function at that point, f of x, y. So the graph of a function of two variables is going to be a surface, z equals f of x, y. So suppose I pick a point x, y in the domain. If I look directly above it at the surface, the height above that point is going to be given by the value of the function at that point x, y. So this is the point x, y, and then z is f of x, y. But yeah, so the graph of a function of f, uh, graph of f of x, y is a surface z equals f of x, y is what you want to be thinking. So for example, what is the graph of f of x, y equals, say, 
two x squared plus five y squared. Well, that's going to be the surface z equals 2x squared plus 5y squared. We've seen that before. What type of surface is this? It's going to be one of our quadric surfaces. Which, which one is it? Is that an elliptic paraboloid? What? It's going to be an elliptic paraboloid. So the graph of this guy is an elliptic paraboloid. Um, use your imagination. <laughs> Not going to be a perfect circle there, but yeah. That's roughly what the graph is going to be. OK, so uh, in general, um, it's going to be rather difficult to actually completely graph the surface in R3. Yes. Uh, but we can graph. Um, we're going to do the same thing we did with quadric surfaces, is we're going to look at traces. Um, so we've already kind of seen how traces work in general. I um, believe there are some homework problems over that. Uh, it's pretty simple, but I want to move on. Um, I would say, so look at the, look in the book um, if you have some doubts on how to do those uh, homework problems. But it's relatively straightforward, and I don't want to spend time dwelling on it. Um, in particular, the traces we're going to be interested in are, are going to be level curves. And in particular, when we put a bunch of level curves together, we get a contour map of the graph of a function, or sorry, a contour map of a function. <clears throat> so, The level curve f of x, y equals c is going to be the set of points x, y, which satisfy f of x, y equals c. kind of says it in the name. <clears throat> so for a level curve, basically what we're doing is we're looking at a certain value of our function, c. We're fixing that value of the function. And we want to look at all the points, x, y, where when you plug it into your function, you get this value, c. So the most useful way to think of this is think of f of x, y. Think of the graph. So think of f of x, y as giving elevation, right? The height above the plane at the point x, y. So you're looking at a map, whoops, x, y gives you sort of the coordinates of a point. And you're looking at the elevation of 
So if you look at the graph of f of x, y, if you're looking at the graph, um, you look at the point above x, y, and you look at the elevation. <clears throat> Right, so a level curve is basically you fix an elevation and you look at all the points which have um, that same elevation on your graph. So basically you're taking your, your, the graph of your, your surface, sorry, the graph of your function f of x, y, you're taking that and you're sort of flattening it down to the x, y plane but you're looking at the set of points which have a given height. So think of like an elevation map, right? All right, that's a flat thing, but it's representing a three-dimensional thing, say like a mountain range or whatever. So we'll do an example of this, but you can put a bunch of level curves together to get an idea of what is going on with the function, like uh, what the, the graph looks like. So if you think of a, con, uh, uh, a map of elevation, you can also call that a contour map. So it gives sort of all the points of the same elevation. So say this is uh, elevation is, say this is like 200, feet, this is like 150 feet, this is 100 feet, 50 feet, and right there we get zero. So this would be like representing like a valley. So each of these is level curves, and when you put them all together, you get a contour map. So for instance, um, here's what this looks like. So our contour map is going to be in, in the plane. But suppose this is the graph of our function right here. And we look at all the different, so we fix different heights. Say this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And we map these down onto the plane. So what we get is that 0, 1, 2, three, four, all those guys are level curves of our function f of x, y in this case. So does everyone get geometrically what's going on with this? <clears throat> okay, so If, so if you have like a specific step between each value of C, so F of X, Y equals zero, one, two, three, four. So if you step each level curve by one, so zero, one, two, three, four. In this case, we stepped it by 50, zero, 50, 100, 150, 200, et cetera. But if you step it by um, the same amount, if your level curves, are close together at a point. That means uh, the graph of your function is steeper there. Or sorry, uh, uh, further apart. No, 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 sorry, 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 sorry. Nope. 
if your level curves close together, um, sorry, no, let me. Sorry, no. Graph is steep. And where the level curves are further apart, your graph is going to be flatter. Right, that means if they're further apart, that means the elevation is not changing very quickly. So you're going to get a flatter, flatter region. If they're close together, that means um, the elevation is changing rapidly. So it's going to be the graph of your function is going to be steep. So let's sketch a contour map of our function. Let's do a simple one. Let's just say x squared plus y squared. So let's just step it by one. So let's look at, say, f of xy equals 0. And let's just draw a few um, level curves of this. Zero, one, two, et cetera. So f of x, y equals zero. We're looking at the set of points satisfying x squared plus y squared equals zero. What is this set of points? Just the origin, right? Only zero, zero satisfies that. So the level curve, f of x, y equals 0, is only the origin. It's a point. So f of x, y equals 1. So we're looking at the set of points satisfying x squared plus y squared equals 1. That is, of course, a circle centered at the origin of radius 1. So that level curve is going to be the circle x squared plus y squared equals 1 f of xy equals 2. We're looking at the set of points satisfying x squared plus y squared equals 2. Well, that's a circle of radius square root 2 in this case. So square root 2 is a little bit bigger than 1, not quite 2, because square root 4 is 2. And then similarly, square root 3, uh, f of x, y equals 3 is going to be circle of radius square root 3. f of x, y equals 4 is going to be the circle of square root root 4, which is 2. <clears throat> and so we're just going to get a bunch of circles. Sorry, this is really kind of sloppy here. Circle centered at the origin, and the, uh, the circles are going to get closer and closer and closer together. This would be a contour map. And if you think about it, they're going to get closer together, right? We said that is steeper, and that's because the surface equals f of x, uh, x squared plus y squared is an elliptic paraboloid. That's the graph of this function. And as you get further out, your graph is getting steeper and steeper and steeper. <clears throat> so
So we can talk about the average rate of change. So we can like pick two points. We can pick two points on our graph and we can look at the average rate of change between those two points of our function. So let me say average rate of change of a function f from say a point P to another point Q. <clears throat> okay, so suppose we have point P and a point Q in the XY plane. If we look at the graph, so if we look at the point on the graph above P and the point on the graph above Q, whoops, let me say this is Q here. So the average rate of change here, and sort of the average steepness of the graph between these two points. And so that's gonna be Sort of the change in height, in other words, how is the F changing from P to Q over the distance from P to Q? Let me, let me put it this way. The change in the height over how is the horizontal changing, horizontal distance So how is f changing from p to q? So f of q minus f of p over the distance from p to q. So for example, Um, suppose we drew a contour map and suppose we had the point, uh, let's say P is the point four negative two. Uh, that's real smart. Hang on, no, 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 no. Sorry, let me, let's do this. P is the point 
four zero, let's say, and let's say Q is zero negative one. And so let's say these are the level curves f of x, y equals 3, 4, 5, and 6. So what's the average rate of change? So these are the level curves for our function f of f from p to q. So <clears throat> we look at the value of f where we end minus the value where we start at. What's the value of f at the point q? Well, we look at what level curve q lies on. What is that? What is the value of f at, at q? Careful, sorry, uh, negative, sorry, negative one is the y value at, at the point q. So q is the point zero, negative one, right? But we want to look at the value of the function there, and that lies on the level curve f of x, y equals four, right? So the value of f at q is four. And what is the value of f at the point p? So this was maybe a little confusingly written down, but at p, we're on the level curve f of x, y equals 6. <clears throat> and so the distance between p and q, well, p is the point of uh, 4, 0. q is 0, negative 1. So it's the difference in x squared plus the difference in y squared, 0 minus negative 1 squared take the square root of it. So we get the square root of uh, 16 plus 1, which is root 17. So the average rate of change is negative 2 over root 17. All right, the change in f, right, f where we end up minus f where we start over the distance between the points. Uh, any questions about that? OK, so just super, super, extremely, extremely briefly, I'm not going to talk really about this at all. But <clears throat> if we have a function of two variables, we look at the level curves. Right. If we set a function equal to a constant and look at the set of points satisfying f of x, y equals that constant, we get a level curve. But if we have a function of three variables, if we look at the set of points x, y, z satisfying f of x, y, z equals a constant, we get a level surface. Right. We get the surface f of x, y, z equals a constant. <clears throat> so for example, if we had a function f of x, gosh darn it, f of x, y, z, whoop, equals x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Let's 
say square root of that. If we look at the level surfaces, right, um, square root x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals a constant. That's going to be the sphere synod at the origin of radius, whatever that constant is. So 0 is going to be a point at the origin. <clears throat> 1 is going to be the sphere of radius 1. 2 is going to be the sphere of radius 2. 3 is going to be the sphere of radius 3 centered at the origin, so on and so forth. So um, all these guys, you set the function equal to a constant. Look at the set of points satisfying it. If you're a function of three variables, you're going to be a surface. And we call that a level surface. Functions of two variables, uh, f of x, y equals a constant, you're going to get a curve. And that's all I'm going to say about that. So um, a denominator was a distance from p to q. It's maybe maybe uh, change in horizontal is not the best way to put it, but it's uh, the average rate of change is the change in f over the distance from p to q. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that's it for today. Um, I will uh, see you guys tomorrow and have a great rest of your day.